So hi guys, I'm Olivia Scherzer, the editorial assistant for Peer Magazine, and I'm here with Caleb Chapman from Colony House, the frontman for Colony House, an American indie rock band from Franklin, Tennessee. So Caleb, just tell me about yourself and Colony House. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, I'm Caleb, and I play in a band with my brother Will and some of my best buddies, Scotty and Park, um, called Colony House. And we've been doing it for a long time now, uh, even though that's kind of weird to say. But we've uh, we've we started even before we were Colony House. But we are now Colony House, and we've been Colony House since about 2014. Put out a few albums, and um, that's pretty. That's the the general synopsis right there. We play music. <laughs> Um, so my first question is, I guess you kind of answered it, but um, how did Colony House come together? Uh, the very brief, I'll try to make it quick. Uh, me and my brother have been playing music together since we could walk. And then uh, after high school, when we really wanted to like give it a go, we met our guitarist, Scotty, at my little sister's birthday party. Because, and my little sister was turning like five or something. I don't know, maybe 10. And Scotty at the time, uh, for reasons that don't need to be explored, uh, didn't have his driver license. Uh, and so he was riding along with my cousin. And my cousin was like, hey, I have to go to my cousin's birthday party. So that's how we met Scott. And my cousin is a loud, obnoxious, funny dude who likes embarrassing people. And so to embarrass Scott, he said, hey, I know you guys are starting a band. You should get Scott to play guitar. And Scott was like, dude, Kane and stop. And uh, and we were like, really? Yeah, you should come. Let's play. Let's hang. So he came over and that's how Scott joined. And then as we started touring, we met Park, who is our bass player. He actually opened up for our band. He was doing like a solo project. And we just hit it off, became friends, and asked if he would fill in on the bass guitar uh, at some point. And he filled in, and he was so good that we decided to make it permanent. <laughs> so That's a cool story. Yeah. And at, uh, when did all of this happen? That took place in, well, we met Scott in maybe 2010, 2011, yeah, 2010, and we started, we were playing under the name, just, it was just kind of me, Caleb. And at first it was a solo project, then it became a band. So we just called it Caleb. And then that got confusing. So we were like, when we put out our first album, uh, we changed it to Colony House. So that was 2014. Yeah. And then Park joined in 2017, I think. Okay. That's yeah. a cool story. So you grew up in a musical family. Yes. Um, your dad is, I'm just going to say it, like he's like a big name in the contemporary Christian music world. Yeah. Um, how would you say your family influenced the growth? Well, not only your music, but influenced the growth of Colony House. Um. Well, yeah, I mean, the obvious, I guess, is that there was always music in the house and we were and we were watching my dad. Um, that was like. You know, that was what me and Will wanted to do since we, I can remember because it, my dad was such a, yeah, influential figure in that industry. And it was, it just was what we wanted to do. So besides just the inspiration of watching dad do what he did and do it well, um, we, uh, you know, my family, my family is just super supportive of all their kids. There's a lot of us. Um and so when we decided uh, to pick up the guitars and the drums and make it part of, you know, I guess, join the family business, uh, there was only cheerleading, you know. And as we kind of walked into that, um, obviously, my dad being uh, who he is, paved the road for some like obvious kind of business partners, if you will, of like, oh, you should work with my manager. You should work with my label. You should work with my... and he wasn't saying that that was just kind of the, you know, obvious. And as we started down that path, it became clear, like actually me and Will, Will's my brother, me and Will want to do something a, a little different than you did dad. And, um, 
And so we just kind of took our music in a different direction. Uh, and he, he, along with my mom and everyone else was just, they've been nothing but supportive and stoked. So it's been fun to kind of blaze our own trail, uh, in more of the kind of alt rock space. Um, and, but also have an amazing resource like my dad and mom who've been in the industry and done, you know, have, have operated at a high enough level of integrity where it's opened up doors for me and my brother that we would be foolish not to, uh, acknowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that colony house plays a different genre. Um, but y'all are all like at least you and your brother, you know, still are Christians and still have that authenticity. Um, so who are your musical influences? Um, well, obviously dad, because he taught <laughs> us pretty much everything we yeah. know. Um, we, it's so funny, you know, you can go back to the high school days and we were all into, you know, emo and screamo and hardcore, anything that was pushing the boundaries, you know. Um, but then as we kind of started our band a lot, there was a ton of like smaller British rock bands that we really got into. There's this band called Athlete. I don't think it's a band anymore. And this band called the Boxer Rebellion uh, that were kind of contemporaries of like Keen or like Coldplay, you know, the kind of the smaller unknown version of. Um, and they really influenced a lot of that early sound. And then, uh, you know, being Tennessee boys, like Kings of Leon was a huge influence. U2 one of those big, big rock bands. Uh, but man, it goes everywhere. Like the influence, I typically go kind of uh, a little bit more singer songwriter um, with my influences, starting back with like Johnny Cash and Waylon and kind of highwaymen dudes up till now, like finding those like Tom Waits and Randy Newman. But uh then will's big big hip-hop he loves kanye so much uh so it goes all over the place park and scott are are like you know everywhere from foo fighters to john mayer i think we just like everything we're not very picky yeah. we're not very yeah. picky and there's there is truly something special about all types of music that we we usually are trying to figure out like ooh, what makes that special so mm -hmm. yeah so what excites you about being in the music industry and performing in 2022 oh interesting that's that question took a very interesting turn with the year 2022 <laughs> yeah, uh, that was pandemic. yeah it's exciting in the way that like going on a road trip that you haven't fully planned out is where you're like i don't know i know that we're, we're going to go to the Grand Canyon and we're going to go, this is analogy. I'm speaking in parable right now, you know, like, uh, you know, we're going to go here, here, and here, everything in between, who knows what's going to happen. That's kind of what it feels like to be a touring band in 2022, where it's like, well, we'll put out some music and hopefully we can go play shows, but who knows these days we, uh, we just ended a tour in the fall. That was like our first tour since the pandemic. And by some miracle, we played all 45 shows and none of them got canceled. No one got COVID on our tour, uh, as far as we know, <laughs> and no one and none of the shows got shut down because of it. So like that was epic to be able to remember, like get back into the swing of like, oh, yeah, this is how we built this band is going and playing shows. We've never had. Uh, like big smash hit or anything but we've played a lot of concerts and that like personal interaction with people who have listened to our music that's been what has fueled the band um so i will say 2022 what's exciting is you know it feels like we're figuring out as much as on any given day it, it, it goes backwards but it feels like we're figuring out like okay we can do this. We can go back into a room full of people and play these concerts and reconnect and 
I think we're all just, everyone that does what we do is hungry to be in the same room with, with people, um, to just, to sing these songs together. That's like, that's kind of the point, you know, when we're writing these songs, it's not, it's not just for us. It's for, it's to start a conversation with our listener. And an important part of that conversation is, is being in front of them, uh, to like have that connection. So I'm excited about, you know, what, you know, what that looks like. So your reach has grown in the past decade, basically. Mm. How do you balance the spotlight and going out on tour with staying grounded and authentic and rooted in that authenticity? Yeah. Being in a band helps because you're being in a band. You, hopefully, I, I don't. I guess not all bands have this, but like we really love each other. We're we're friends on and off stage. So like, it's it's a lot easier to not take it so seriously when you're out there with your with your dogs and you're just like, uh, on any given night something funny happens, something unexpected happens, something embarrassing happens. And as opposed to wearing that all yourself, you have people to laugh about it with. You have people to like cry about things with or, or fight with. And it's like, well, oh, we're figuring this out together. Um, I think that keeps you, I think that keeps you grounded. Uh, you know, we've never wanted, I don't think we've, maybe we've wanted it, but I don't think we've never had it of that like celebrity there's no celebrity really with Colony House. Um, and that's important to us uh, for it to feel. Someone asked me, like, what do you want it to feel like when you're at a Colony House show? And I was like, well, I want people to feel like they're getting something special and like they paid money. They deserve a show. They like I want to build that anticipation of like, you know, the lights go down and it's exciting. But I also want it to feel like, oh, they just just like us because we are, you know, so it's important. We're trying to just always knock down the wall of like performer and audience. It's like, yes, we will, we have practiced a lot at this, but that's just one, one side of this. Like the other side of the colony house coin is making sure, you know, we're, we're just like you, we don't have it figured out. Yeah. Um, so my next question is kind of like about grief. And I know your family have spoken and written so openly about this subject, um, specifically with your sister when she passed. Um, yeah. So even years later, how do you continue to process that grief? Because I know so many young people are, especially during the pandemic, have lost, may have lost a loved one. Mm, yeah. Yeah, it's been such a heavy season. And I, I, I think... I think it's safe to say everyone has lost someone. I don't know if it's how close that person is, but like everyone knows that kind of that loss. And um, I think grief is an interesting, it's an interesting thing because it, it really is, um, it really brings people together, which sounds super, that's a really cliche thing to say. But I think when you're grieving, uh, you get a glimpse into that eternal, like what, what's happening eternally. Like there's got to be more than just this life. There's got to be more to this. Like what is this for? And those big questions that feel unanswered most of the time and maybe remain unanswered. I think that's, that is grief is the big question mark in all of it. Why did this happen? Why did, why did something so horrible um, happen to our family? Why did something so horrible happen to our whole world? And um, uh, I think for me, part of the process is learning that it's okay to not be able to answer that question. Uh, and I think there's a, there's unity and there's something really universal about being okay in that tension of, of not knowing why, why we are hurting like this. Um, as far as specifically to my family and our story, um, 
it's it's something I think when you know for people that might be watching this that don't know it, this was a while ago now over over 10 years ago when my sister passed away from an accident she was five at the time and it was you know it was just heartbreaking time in the families it you know you never you don't there's no rule book or guideline on how to walk through grief like you try your best with counseling and all that but there's just everybody has their own story and we were pretty public about it about we about walking that out and letting people know that there's hope here, even though this is a devastating time, uh, there's hope in, and what we believe. And, um, I think now 10 years later, uh, I'm okay with not being, this is not, this is not a, a subtle hint at you or anything, but like, I'm okay with not like talking so openly about it. Like, I think for a while, it was on display for the world. We did Larry King live. We, there were people magazine interviews and things like this, where it's like, that was, I don't think it was wrong to do that, but that, that was a really devastating time to have to go out and, and plant our flag saying, you know, I, we don't have the answers, but we have hope that we will see our sister and our daughter again. And I still believe that is true, but I'm, I'm also okay, more okay with not having to uh, say it's all going to be okay because it's any given day. It doesn't feel like that on any given day, 10 years later, it still hurts and there's still tears and still those big questions. So um, I would say for those, you know, for, for any of y'all who may be walking through that, like, why did this happen? Why is this happening? Why is my mom sick? Why is my dad sick? Why did my grandpa die, you know, from this pandemic or whatever it is? Um, I think it like, it's okay to feel confused and don't let that be, don't let that be kind of the hang up. That's like, well, I don't, I don't have an answer. So it's all bogus. There is no point. Um, I don't think that's it. I just think um, that when you walk through grief, the only the best analogy I've been able to think of is like it feels like you're looking at an abstract painting too close and you're right face to face with this painting and because it just happened and you're in the middle of it. But as you get further and further away from it, you back up, you back up. And it all starts coming into focus. You're like, oh, I have to stand 20 feet away from that painting to see that it's it's this huge painting. But now I can see the whole picture and it makes sense. Um, I think the further we get away from grief, little pieces fall into place. Not the whole thing, but little pieces here and there start going like, um, oh, there's something more happening here. There's something bigger uh, to this story. So... I don't know if that's, I, I don't know if that is encouraging or discouraging. Uh, somehow it's encouraged me. <laughs> no, I think it's encouraging. Um, I respect actually that answer. I think it puts a new perspective on it. Mm. And I just pray and hope that it will help this next generation. Because yeah. I feel like Generation Z it's, are more, I guess, lack of a better word, realistic about all of these subjects. Yeah. Um, very yeah. True. So yeah, I, I just thank you for sharing that. Yeah, so on a lighter note, yeah. um, what is the biggest piece of advice you can share with Gen Z? Well, who am I? I'm a millennial. You don't want to hear from me. I think I'm a millennial. No, I'm kidding. Gen Z. I've got sisters. I've got some Gen Z sisters. Uh, I, Oh, I've never, I've never thought about this. Uh, I, I love, I love the, like kind of how you mentioned, like the real, how real Gen Z is. Call it, they call it how they see it. Uh, and I think as opposed to me incur, you know, offering some kind of new perspective, like don't lose that, be real. And like, 
I think there's a social movement in the younger generation that they're seeing things they're like they are calling out um for like real equality in in our world and I think all of that gets all jumbled up in the kind of political mess of like well are you here or are you here um I think that that's all the noise that you can cancel out but the realness of like Hey, there's some there's some things we need to fix, and uh, I think Gen Z, with how savvy they are on social media and all those things, how clever it is, like as much as that can be a just a total waste of time, it also can be a really amazing tool. Um, and so, like again, I'm like, may, I'm starting to feel like the old guy, but I don't want to be the old guy who's like all these young whipper snappers. They're, they're so, you know, whatever, so jaded, so uh, they think they know more. But what I will say, this will be my advice, I guess. Uh, I've, I've, at this point, I've just said, you guys are doing great. Uh, but there, there is wisdom in people that have lived longer than you. And I'm learning that sometimes when I, I, I think someone said something once where they're like, be a good steward of your relationships, be a good steward of, of your relationship with your grandma, who you think is, is out of her mind and hasn't, you know, who, who says things that are wildly inappropriate. And so often we go, well, it's just a different generation, you know, not the greatest excuse for being racist or for being, for being, you know, like super legalistic or something. There's no excuse for that. However, don't throw What's the, I don't know if this is an appropriate term. I've never really thought about it. Don't throw the baby out with the bath water. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, I've it, heard, I've it's, heard but it's, but it's like, there's not the, the people that have been here longer. They have, there's, there's wisdom there. And, um, I think, uh, something I'm learning myself and maybe if you're editing any of this, maybe this is the chunk that you choose because I'm, I'm a very meandering person. Uh, but I think we are in an age where everyone, everyone has a platform and everyone feels like they have to share their opinion. Everyone feels like they have to make noise in order to be heard because there's so much noise. And I would encourage Gen Z that you don't have to make noise to be heard. Uh, and you don't necessarily have to be the, the squeakiest wheel to get the grease, as they say. Um, I think that there's so much more power in listening. And that is, that is where everything's upside down right now. I feel like with, you know, everyone has these powerful tools in their hands called cell phones. And we think that we are, uh, masters at whatever we have an opinion on and the truth is we have so much to learn from each other on all sides of the equation on every in every political party in every race in every religion there are things to learn from each other and i would just say i would encourage gen z to be uh, leaders in listening as opposed to leaders in speaking because my generation and the generations ahead of us, I think, have been pretty good at megaphoning their opinions. <laughs> and that I would love to see that change and, and be a, a much more, um, yeah, just intuitive uh, generation. Yeah, I like that. That's a bold quote right there, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Listeners of learning. Um, so kind of wrapping up, do you, meaning Colony House, yes, have anything exciting in the works that you feel like sharing? So yes. This will be in the May issue of Peer, but so. Okay. The May issue. Is that what you said? Yes. Okay. okay. What, what would I be allowed to say by May? Um, <laughs> uh, no, I mean, we're, we don't have like any huge secret plans. There are some, there are some things that are happening later this year. Uh, that will be a big step for this band, which I'm excited. I can't really say much, but, and I don't know if we'll know by May, if we'll have announced this by May. Um, so 
but what I can say is we have been writing and we're about to start recording our next album. Uh, literally, next you know, we leave we leave Monday for you know a month and we're just going and we're recording our next album. So that is kind of what's gonna twenty twenty two is gonna be new album year for Colony House. Hopefully, it comes out in twenty twenty two. That I don't know. Um, but I wish I we just had a we just had a meeting about this whole year and planned out all our fun little projects. And there's a lot of exciting stuff. Not quite at liberty to say all the exciting stuff. Can't make promises. I don't know if I can keep yet. <laughs> no worries. That's, so, that's new music sounds, is what I yeah. can say. That sounds exciting. <laughs> um, so just three more questions. They're kind of like rapid fire questions. Love so it. answer these as quickly as possible or whatever. Yeah. Um, what's a self-care habit when you're feeling overwhelmed? Running. I run. I run and I don't take anything. I don't listen to music. I don't have a Fitbit on my wrist. I am, I am a human being running through the world. And uh, I don't, sometimes if I'm trying to like actually work out and like make myself get faster or like train or whatever, then I'll like, I'll be more intentional about like my pace or knowing. But for me, like a self-care thing, if I'm feeling like, weight of the world vibes just put on shoes that's all you need shoes and shorts or whatever and just go run and then you don't have to run fast you just run and i make my best decisions i think after i've run i feel clear i talk to god like without even having to talk to god i'm just listening it's just one of those things it's like this is nice so that's mine Nice. That's the first time I've ever heard running the answer to that question. <laughs> um, so what are you currently listening to? This can be music or podcasts or anything. Okay. Uh, let's see. I've been listening to, hold on. Uh, it's funny. I've, I've been listening to a lot of my own music right now. Uh, these new ideas, cause we're in writing mode. So I, uh, I get pretty stuck in that, but it looks as if I've been listening. There's a band called Will Dorado that I've been listening a lot to a band. We went and saw some of our friends are in a band called sports and they're, they were awesome. We've been listening to them. Uh, and, uh, I've been, I found this girl named Sierra Farrell. And she's like this old Western country and like almost like old Dolly Parton. She's really cool. Always listening to uh, like Vampire Weekend. Looks like I've been listening to The Strokes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm all over the place. There's a kid out of Nashville called Briston Maroney who's been doing great. He's been just crushing it. and I love his stuff. So, nice. yeah. Um, last question um, is, what's your favorite Bible verse? Ooh, um, my my typical go to is is First John four eight, which is uh, I'm probably not nailing this, but uh, per, like the piece of that that I've always resonated with is if you do not love, then you do not know God because God is love. And I've always loved that definition of God. That's been like, uh, it was a huge kind of like, man, if you, if you meet someone who, who claims this belief and there's not love there, then I'm like, man, that's a big Bible verse for you. If God is love, if God equals love, you know, um, so, and it also is just like, man, I, there's, I, I get to share the hope of the gospel in my, in my love, for, because if, if I believe that verse, then my, my love of my neighbor, my love of my family, my love of my brother and my band, um, of the stranger that dis wildly disagrees with me, if I can love that person, then I don't have to, I don't have to be 
an apologetic meaning. I don't have to prove to them the existence of God. I just need to prove to them the existence of love.